selfish, so I've now pressed recording in progress. Well, you are here, and I am here, and I think I'll only need you for an hour. What I've done is I'm doing these via Zoom all the time now, and people get so vocal and excited about the interview that they talk to me for two hours. We only have 3,000 words to run, four or five sides, and I end up editing so much. So there's quite a lot to get in, and I think it would be a lot of fun because, um, you know, you've been around a while now. I think you qualify for this. <laughs> I like your T-shirt, by the way. Thank you very much. They come from um, these hip young things down in Brighton called TSPTR. They're into all of that Los Angeles culture. And, um, you know, Shindig's going great, but it doesn't make us millionaires. But I've become very good at blagging things. So I got a 1,500 quid record deck the other day. I I I'm dressed by these fellows. So, um, you know, I can't complain. Well, no, you're properly, you know, you're targeted. I mean, I, I do think that the magazine, people will always like magazines. There's no doubt about yeah. that. Yeah. And because um, they're a nice thing to hold, you can put them on your, you know, people don't want always want to read things online. People like stuff that's targeted. I mean, I buy it. Um, Thank you. Well, I buy good. the music magazines. Some of them I go through very quickly. Um, I, know, I, think I read in about five minutes. I know. I mean, my neighbour here in North London, Tom Doyle, you know, a long time writer for Q uh, and Mojo. We were talking about Q the other day. And of course, some things just can't exist anymore. And he was saying, you know, targeted magazines like us and Electronic Sound, um, actually can probably survive better in this modern age because it's the completest, the purest, the collectors that still buy print, isn't it? Rather yeah. than the pop fan. Well, I always thought the queue was slightly pointless, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I mean, it had its function in the 80s, um, but didn't seem to have a function now. Um, no. And it's not a magazine I ever greatly liked, I have to say. No. Um, it was too mainstream for me um and it was too it was just too mainstream for me and kind of you know blokey really yeah and it became that increasingly it was it was women with their cleavage out and who did coke in the toilets at some club you know and i think they traded on that for for 20 years but anyway i've got a pub appointment at six it's right how's how's the weather up in wales it's, it's uh just this afternoon i went out for a walk and it started raining and now we have rain and actually, that's quite OK, because um, uh, it was too hot yesterday. I, I can't do it anymore. I used to love being in the sun. I used to love sunbathing. And it's just gone. Things change as you get older. And it was too hot yesterday. I went sunbathing and it just did me in. So 26 here today, but it's getting a little bit inclement. So I sense there might be a clap of thunder later, but I'm still going to uh -huh. go out for a pint. because Who, Who's that behind you? Is that the monkeys? It is. It's That was the Rhino Monkeys vinyl box set from about 15 or so years ago. Nice. Um, it's nice. It's a nice, nice little thing. But anyway, I'll get. Okay, happy. yeah, let's. I, let's I could talk let's. all day, but um, obviously there's a lot to talk about here. And just just for your information, if these are writers that have come from our questions that have come from our writers, some of them we might deviate from, and as a result, we might reinvent a question that is a bit similar to one of these. Essentially, yeah, okay. you know, I, I'm going to write twenty questions, come what may, but we we might expand one and lose another. But I'll go from the beginning, and with all of this, it's very linear. So, um, question yeah, one: Do you right. remember the point at which pop music and pop culture became a driving force in your life? First as a consumer, then as a professional. Yeah, I mean, I suppose my general point is is that there's a lot of people who quite like music. They'll buy one or two albums a year, the big albums of the year. They'll listen to the radio. They'll go on Spotify and noodle around a bit. Yeah. Um, but it's not an obsession for them, unlike for me and all, you know, the writers of, of um, you know, in your magazine and the readers of your magazine who are all obsessives. Um, and, you know, there's, um, you know, we're not like, you know, the general run of music consumers. Um, the first record I bought was Del Shannon's Little Town Flirt in early 63 when I was nine. 
And hey presto, then the Beatles happened and then the 60s happened and I was watching it all on Ready Set to Go and Top of the Pops later on in the year when I was 10, so, and early 64. So that was that really. And um, um, so that was when it started. And of course I saw the whole 60s. I saw Bob Dylan arrive. I saw the birds arrive on telly, obviously I was still 10, 11. Yeah. So if that's not going to get you, nothing will. Um, when I turned professional was um, in April 77 when I started writing for Sounds. Um, and that was as a direct result of seeing Sex Pistols and The Clash a few months before October, November 76. And that galvanized me um, totally as it did a whole micro generation. And so the message I got from Sex Pistols and Clash was, if you're going to do what you're going to do, do it now. And what I wanted to do was right. So those are the two, um, those are the two beginnings, really. And of course, you had a, a very good classical education in the later years at Oxford. So how did you find coming? Was this when you were at university or just after you'd left the 70s? No, no, I went to Cambridge. I went to Cambridge. Cambridge. Uh, and when, when did you finish there? I finished 75 and funnily enough I'm just talking with this about this to Mary Beard at the moment because she asked me this question you know what did you study when you were at Cambridge and I can't remember a fucking thing <laughs> I can remember going to see Dr Feelgood uh, and Toots and the Maytals but I don't remember anything so I gotta go I'm going to go and see my mum uh, next week she's in her 90s and upstairs in the attic there's a whole load of papers and I've got to try and reconstruct what it is I actually did for three years because I have no memory of it because it was something I had to do in order not to work um I know the thing, and yeah. the real the real thing for me was always pop culture and of course mm -hmm. there were very few people like that at Cambridge mm -hmm. and in fact one of this is why I bonded with Tony Wilson a bit later on because he's he'd also been to Cambridge and he was also a pop obsessive and there were, there were very, very few of us. There were probably about 10 in the whole university and we all gravitated to each other. That's why I ask, because I think, you know, this, now we have, that's a question later, but we have the Spotify generation where every young person knows about music, doesn't necessarily love it, but at the, at the height of academia in the mid seventies, the kids going to Cambridge clearly weren't into rock and roll music on the whole, were they? So you were, Quite different. No, well, I used to, I used to go to, um, you know, I was mad, I was mad for it. Really. There was a great record store in the central town called Andy's Records uh, in the market uh, a couple of days a week, and I used to haunt that. And then I used to go down to London because I'm in London, I'm a London Yeah. Um, and uh, I used to haunt Rock On in Goldbourne Road and buy '60s records and rockabilly records, and so from '73 onwards. So. That was always going on. Um, and the class, what the classical education taught me was paradoxically, I'd been studying stuff that was 2000 years old. Mm -hmm. And it gave me a long sense of history. And also what it did is taught me, I remember I made the decision when I left, I thought, well, that's all very nice. I was doing that, I was studying that, you know, all very nice, it's over put it in a box what's happening now what is actually and it wasn't the novel it wasn't poetry it wasn't even film because the film was sort of way out of one's reach it was pop music and it was pop culture that's what's happening and so you know the big message i got in autumn so probably november 75 but was patty smith's horses and that was the big record that and then it was an and then it was, and then it was an, an, an inevitable down, downhill slide to the Ramones, which changed absolutely everything. Got you. And yeah, it's a record I still love. Yeah, absolutely. that daddy is wonderful, isn't it? Absolutely. And um, I think I'm going to make a question out of that. I, I'll combine it into something later on. I'll have a nice job editing this. It'd be a lot of fun. But I thought I'd get that in. It wasn't actually a question anywhere. So I've extended question seven to 7.5 um but <laughs> question two 1966 the year the decade exploded yeah. has become something of a you are text amongst connoisseurs of 60s white heat you were 12 13 years old <clears throat> as you just said and were you aware of the radical social changes that were taking place or was it all about the pop records i, I could feel i could feel it i could feel it 
I was a West Londoner. I was brought up in Ealing. I was living in Ealing at that point, which was a big mod area. Yeah. They even had the, their own mod. Ealing had its own mod group, the Eyes, cool. who were actually yeah. <laughs> were actually slightly shit. Let us whisper it, but they were also totally great. And I used to go to school every day uh, to yeah. Ealing Broadway from Acton Town, and there were these huge posters for the Eyes with their rugby shirts with the. And I remember that very strongly. So I felt as though I was living in a pop environment. Mm -hmm. um, and also that was obviously where um, the Stones played the Ealing Club in 62, 63. So it was a big, I just remember it all felt very pop. Um, I'll always, I was mad keen on the Yardbirds. I obviously adored the Yard shapes of things was a huge record for me. And I remember buying an NME summer annual and they said, what is our, describe your music. And they said, images in sound. And I thought, oh. What's that? That's very interesting. I like that idea. You know, I was only 12, I didn't know anything. But that concept of synesthesia, really, images and sound, um, was very appealing. So I was aware that, and of course I was listening, like a lot of other people, I was listening to Pirate Radio, uh, Radio Caroline South, and they used to play the American Top 40. So I, I used, to, I do remember very strongly hearing Along records like Along Comes Mary and Seven and Seven Years. And these are extraordinary records, um, you know, and paper, I mean, obviously, and then the hits, which are paperback writer, you know, records like Paperback Writer. And, you know, so you do have this extraordinary thing. And in a way, it was great for me to, it's nice that people, it's become an ur text. It's, I'm always very happy when that happens because you can never um, take it for granted. But, um, I think it was interesting for me to go back to a period when I was young and trying to figure out why, it, what, exactly why it was I felt like I did then, which was incredibly right. exciting. It was a great, because that, you know, you're just a pre-teen, so the hormones aren't quite in place, but it's, you're exploding inside at the same time. And for that music <laughs> and everything was so modern, it, it was a perfect time to be sort of coming of age, wasn't it? Yeah, well, my hormones are all fucked up, John. We're not going there. Uh, well, um, we we'll, we'll touch on that book we'll later, but we'll, we'll, um, we'll save that for later. Let, let's get because that you've answered that brilliantly. Because I mean, that was a, a you know a, a brilliant, a brilliant piece, and of course, putting it into perspective from that age is is I think is crucial, and I think you've answered that very eloquently. And well, also, John, also, John, can I just say? Yeah. The disaster chart of April 1967, okay? Look at the chart from April 1967 to show how far everything had fallen. Well, There's two decent, two decent records in there. Yeah. And the rest is Engelbert, yeah. two different versions of This Is My Song, yeah. Edelweiss. Uh, and I remember then listening, and I just couldn't believe how shit it was. I hated yeah. those records. Yes. And the experience of the 60s that nobody talks about was having to sit through five shit records to get to the record that you really wanted to hear. So, I mean, I grew up, in, I'm 50 now, so it's the 80s. And, yeah. you know, it was, it, the, the Jam were my band and, and you'd watch Top of the Pops, watching all of this rubbish to come to one record. And, and 66, it was just... The pop music wasn't crap. The pop, so everything was enjoyable on the whole, wasn't it? And and as time went by, it it became very good in places, but the mainstream got a lot more diluted, didn't it? Yes, and that in a way is the point of the book because it's 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 that moment of compression where everything comes together and it can't stay together because you're trying to put all these different elements into the two mm -hmm. to three minute single, mm -hmm. and it's just not it just flies apart in 67 in all those wonderful British psych records that we all love that are about four records stuck together you know like um, Pretty Things Defecting Grey and Tomorrow yeah. Revolution which are almost like mini symphonies really. Yeah now brilliant okay I'm gonna go into the next um, we go forward a little bit hindsight suggests that punk's year zero scorched earth policy was little more than another form of industry baiting confrontation tactic the lineage from mod to psych to prog to pub rock to punk now looks like one continuous and logical line. Have we now got over that desire to apply genres and pigeonholes to the changing faces of pop and rock? Well, I have, but I don't know whether contemporary critics have. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, 
all I will say, it's a completely different world now to the one that I was young in, and that's okay. Mm. It's fine. Yeah. You know, the, I, I can't stand people saying, oh, it's not like it was in the old days. But of course it isn't like it was in the bloody old days. You know, the period that that question is talking about is 45 years. I mean, that's, come on, it's a hell of a long time. So um, as far as punk rock is concerned, why it succeeded was focus and scarcity. What McLaren did, and that was his genius, was to focus everything down. Um, I took some pictures in, in, in North London, in, in, in North Kensington in January 77, and they ended with the graffiti of the clash written on one of the stanchions of the Westway. And the whole point of that was to show that the city was dead and the only signs of life were coming from the clash, the damned and sex pistols. That was in that very, very brief it period. It was grey and deprived, wasn't it, at that point? It was bloody yeah. awful. It was a great time in black music. Yeah. It was a great, it was okay. a great time in dark reggae. Yeah. But yeah. it was difficult to experience those cultures. I certainly wasn't experiencing those cultures. I've gone back in the years since and gone back and you know, I mean I I loved the dub. I was I did hear dub reggae during that period, but it was and in fact had a couple of dub albums, particularly uh Pick a Dub by Keith Hudson, which is a mm -hmm. sensational record. But I wasn't going to discos. I never gone to discos, uh, no. sadly, because there was some brilliant funk music and disco music being made yeah. in that period. It was the sort in of white boy music. in white boy rock. It was a disaster zone. Yeah, that's right. The working classing, all of the sort of Essex soul boys, they had it, and obviously the very poor, very victimised black communities in Notting Hill had it. But if you're a white middle class kid from Ealing, they were very different worlds, weren't they? Well, you know, I used to go to. To reggae stores to buy records and you'd have to run the gauntlet but that was okay i didn't mind no. um but i was determined to have the record so i did i did have a few dub albums but i wasn't going to go to shabin's it was uh it was that it, was yeah. i did a little bit later but it was still scary it wasn't it wasn't my world it wasn't i didn't want to int i didn't want to intrude yeah brilliant and i felt i was intruding so brilliant and staying on punk um Punk seemed to get commodified quite quickly once it lost its feminist edge. Do you remember any telltale signs that this was happening at the time? Oh, uh, the Stranglers. You don't know. Like <laughs> Actually, let's make this question one. Why do you hate the Stranglers so much? And do you now accept the Sex Pistols were essentially just a dysfunctional boy band treated by Malcolm McLaren? That's the next question. So we'll save the Sex Pistols bit. But the Stranglers... We can bridge these two at once. Um, what was it? Very sort of misogynistic. Very. Um, I didn't hate. I didn't hate them. No. I just. I just heartily disliked them, and yeah. I just liked their attitude and their attitudes. Very and I thought that, I thought they were bullies, and it's as simple as that. And I've always heartily disliked bullies. Yeah. End of. The, yeah. You know whether or I, whether or not I like the Stranglers is you know. Absolutely, of no account. They had that following, didn't they? The sort of stra not Stranglers Army. They I never. That. I mean, I never went to the Stranglers gig, 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 so I can't say. But um, I just wasn't. I didn't like it. It seemed to be old information at the time. But the time you're talking about is forty-five years ago. Yeah. So who cares? Yeah. Um, but I think I think that I was always I was interested in punk at the time because I thought it was new. Mm -hmm. And it was a kind of revolution for a micro generation and everything had to be new. Um, and what was new in terms of gender was men being, young men being a bit hopeless and kind of vulnerable, like Subway Sect, you know, they'd be calling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is great, it's fantastic. They weren't being macho, uh, I adored Subway Sect. Um, and women being strong, hence, mm -hmm. Um, Polly Starring, who I was friends with in the very early days, and Susie, who was sensational in 77 and 78, and, and the slits and gay advert playing bass. I mean, this was something new. Women hadn't done that before. No. Um, no. And that was, to me, incredibly, and Penetration, who were, who were also fantastic. Yeah. And to me, that was very exciting because it was new. Yes, um, and it dated very quickly, didn't it? I mean, by 79, there was punk sort of in the charts still, but it had gone to the children. I mean, it was really that year, which you're talking about, 76, 77, where all of these things were so new, but it did get commodified, didn't it? Yeah, there were some good later groups. I, I did like the members um, um, quite a lot, actually. Um, 
but I wasn't, you know, I was by 79, I was in the world of, I was in the world of factory and joy division. So yeah. that was, we'll, uh, we'll come to that in a bit. And just wasn't my question, but um, do you now accept the Sex Pistols were essentially <laughs> just a dysfunctional boy band created by McLaren? Well, you know, do I now accept that presupposes that I've denied it and yeah. that that's something that I don't want to agree with? It's in the bloody book. Yes. McLaren actually says in the book that this, I thought in my own head, I was so out of my head, that the Sex Pistols would be like the Bay City Rollers. And the fascinating thing about the, base, the Sex Pistols is that they were put together by McLaren, but you had four young men who really wanted to do something. So the beginnings might have been plastic, they might have been assembled as a boy band, but what they did once they got together and what they, their interaction with audiences made them something, you know, way beyond anything that was manufactured. Um, it galvanized really yeah. a micro generation, including myself. And that's what's interesting in pop music. Things can start from very impure motives and still have an extraordinary effect. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and next question, we're still in this territory as such, but coming up to um, one of your recent compilations that I oh, yeah. very much enjoyed. And um, so <laughs> you chronicled the 70s on 70, 71 yeah. Rock Dreams on yeah. 45 and 72, 76, All Our Times Have Come yeah. with Affection. And from all of your comps of this period, you clearly favour pop, some rock, proto-punk and of course punk. Someone who as someone who embraced punk's year zero, do you think you'll ever be able to afford some merit to the lesser known purveyors of prog rock? The absolutely, abs absolutely not. Time no. changes. Time changes. I'm sorry. I'm not saying it's shit. No. Um, and if somebody wants to go and do comps, uh, you know, uh, on that, you know, of that nature, then great. You know, I'd like to. I would actually give them a listen, but honestly, I just. As I used to say in the 60s, I can't make that scene. No. Well, Stanley did it with English weather, didn't he? The, the ace compilation English weather sort of... Yeah, so, you know, it's not being... It's not just... how, how did you find it at the time? And, of course, when punk came along, how did you... Because it, it was such recent history, but it was so much in the past. When, so when you were at university, it was the sort of pub rock and the reggae. How did, I imagine at university in that environment, let's use the middle class, you know, predominantly public school kids there, they probably loved prog, didn't they, at uni? I don't, well, you see, I went to, I went there in 72, so prog was already, you know, the first club. I, ha I actually have three records that could be called prog in downstairs somewhere. I've got the first ELP album because I like Lucky Man, because yep. of, of the mad Lovely. scene. It's lovely. Uh, yeah. I've got the first King Crimson album, which I really like. Yeah, me too. The Court of the Crimson King. And I got the third Yes album. And those are the three proggy records that yeah. I've got. The rest, the rest of it, as far as I'm concerned, I'm afraid it's just bollocks. Yeah. But um, again, that's neither here nor there. I don't remember, I don't remember people playing much music at all. That's no. very weird. I do remember it wasn't, oh, I know it wasn't prog. It was fucking Grateful Dead Live bootlegs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. Endless versions of Bloody Casey Jones. Oh, God. I guess. And I, remember, I, I remember there was a party in my first year, that would be not in 72, and everybody was smoking industrial strengths of weed. You know, there was a lot of drugs at that point. There was a lot of dope. There was a lot of acid. Yeah. Um, that's where I did acid. Um, and um, there's a party, and they were playing all these dreary Grateful Dead records, and I turned, rocked up with. And I remember playing in a row, Queen Bitch, Vicious, and um, half of, you know, the Back in the USA album, because I just wanted some excitement. Yes. I didn't, I didn't want all this dreary crap about, you know, yeah. you better I mean, watch your speed. They came from the same time, but they are so, so different, aren't they? And that excitement of Lou Reed and, and you know, Alice Cooper and those sort of acts were so different. Yeah. I, I guess prog rock, if you were there, it was the sick form common room, wasn't it? It was the sort of 17 year old boys trying to be deep after reading Lord of the Rings. Yeah, when I was 16, 17, I was West Coast. That's what I was doing. Yeah. I was, right. totally, well, I was totally West Coast. Brilliant. That was, that was 70, 71. Oh, I love that. 60, 69, 70, 71, and catching and doing a lot of catching up. Yes. Because well, I didn't have enough money to buy records before then. Let's move on from the sort of 
punk and prog and um but we're only in 79 it's um possibly your first proper job how much of a culture shock was it moving from london to manchester in 1979 to work for granada tv what were the differences between the two cities music scenes you already mentioned joy division a minute ago so i imagine th this was very pivotal for you was it moving there We've just frozen. Yes, because I, th I think that. Oh, I'm half losing you. Hi, can you hear me? I can. The video's static, but that doesn't matter. Can you hear me? How's it doing, John? You're back. You're back. I was going to ask my daughter if our internet's okay, but you you've frozen a little bit. Um, but you're moving slightly. Maya, how's the internet? kind of gone a bit frozen i just oh reconnect yeah is it okay my the internet hi john how's that oh, doing that's that's great yeah it Turn it off, turn it back on. It always works, doesn't it? Good. Um, OK, so first off, London was kind of, you know, there were a lot of derelict parts of London when uh, in the late 70s. Um, everybody forgets how poor a lot of the city was. But going to Manchester, it was like a bloody bombsite. Um, it was really desperate. Um, it was away from my parents, away from my class. Uh, Granada was very left wing um as befitted a company that was really in if you like very connected to the community and very much it's kind of heart and soul and aimed to reflect the northwest and its programming it had a social felt it had a social function which of course is long gone i mean we're talking 40 42 years ago um and that was a complete education you know i got educated in in socialist politics and i've been a labor voter ever since really um so it's very pivotal in that way obviously the manchester music scene was much smaller um obviously london was where the music industry was which in the punk days to be honest is part of the problem and one of the reasons i went off punk is that you know by kind of late summer 77 early or awesome 77 it just become a blizzard of cocaine really um mm -hmm. it's horrible when the music industry got involved um and you had all these music industry punk groups and they were all awful yeah. um so Manchester seemed like a very much smaller kind of self-generating scene. There was a kind of older, there were older groups like Sad Cafe and there were the 60s remnants. But uh, obviously there was Buzzcocks um, and uh, well, ob there was Object Mute. There were four, there were four independents. There was New Hormones Buzz slash Buzzcocks. And I'd been very friendly with Buzzcocks um, and the, they were part of the reason I went up there. Mm -hmm. and um because i thought they were terrific really all the way through um and there was a uh, rabid records just tosh ryan and um and started up in martin hannett and uh, jilted john and uh then there was object records which was steve sullivan and um spherical objects and then of course there was factory and tony had helped me get the job at granada because he wanted someone who was a name enough writer in the music press to write about his groups. Morley had done it, but Morley had gone down to live in London. Um, and in fact, I only put this together when I met Paul to talk about his Tony Wilson book. And we put it together that he'd gone down to London. Tony was a great manipulator. He'd gone down to, Paul had gone down to London in autumn of 78. 
and Tony had got me on board in late 78 um, and I went up in April 79 because he wanted somebody with access to live reviews, lead reviews, etc. features to be in town to write about his groups and the main group being Joy Division. So I got, I lived with Tony for the first and his wife, Ed Hillary, for the first two months I was at Granada. And so I was thrust into factory world really. And how was that exciting? It was, it, that obviously felt very, did it feel new or did it feel sort of anti new and, uh, and sort of of, of its own accordance? It was very much working out the personalities. Mm -hmm. um, when I got a flat, I lived near Rob Gretton and it took me a while to get used to Rob. And then when I did, I became very friendly with him. Um, and in fact, I gave the oration at his funeral. I adored Rob and his partner, Leslie Gilbert, who I'm still in touch with. And I got very friendly with Martin um, as well. And that meant navigating blizzards, blizzard, a blizzard of dope. Mm. Um, and so it was really dealing with all that. And um, I adored Joy Division. I thought they were incredible um, and still do. I saw them a lot in that spring and summer. And um, really got it. I mean, I really, I don't think I've ever seen a group quite as good as that. No. Um, uh, simply because Ian held nothing back yeah um, and the music was terrific as well they were so exciting and I saw that I, I liked them on big stages I saw them at the free trade hall supporting John Cooper Clark and they were amazing and I saw them at Lee Festival um, and again I thought they were great in a small club they were almost in like the factory they were almost too intense and in a big space they, they could fill it and, and also at the Apollo um, and they played in the, autumn, in the autumn. So that was Joy Division, really. Um, I think that is that. I mean, I'm going to go on to the next question. I mean, is there more about Manchester? I imagine you went up for the Buzzcocks and then Joy Division. That that was probably the sort of two poles of of Manchester, was it for you at that moment? Well, also no. there was dealing. You know, there was dealing with the politics of being in a, in a very large big media organisation. Um, you know, it was very intense. It was very difficult to get jobs in telly and it was a really, it was a tough world um, and I had to fit into that. I nearly didn't. I nearly fucked the whole thing up and I was pretty useless the first six months um, because I thought the whole point was to have fun and of course it wasn't. It was an industrial process mm -hmm. and um, you had to be really on point, which um, I can be on point when I'm, you know, when I'm working for myself, but if I'm working for other people, my mind wanders. And um, so there was a lot of that uh, dealing. I found it very difficult dealing with the politics of Granada, actually. Um, and it taught me, really, that was the second to last job I ever had. And it taught me that it really I wasn't really made for paid employment. <laughs> Fair enough. And we're going to go to 1984 and the book business, which was which was actually the last time I quit my last job in 84, which is working at TVAM, which was another kind of disaster. Oh, yes. Right. I will quickly touch. I mean, you can bring that into this. This question is about your book. But just actually before this, just tell me about TVAM. I remember seeing that as a 13 year old. And of course, it was the future. So, I mean, was that very exciting or was it absolutely no, it, no, rotten? It, it was the future and it was shit. Um, yeah. It really was. It was chaotic. It was stupid. It was I got myself a sinecure. All I had to do was program one pop video a day for mm. four weeks so I had to program seven pop videos and that's all I had to do for a week so I had a sinecure for about six months and that was great and you used to get these huge two inch tapes and take them down to VT and it meant of course I was immersed in the pop music of that period and I remember you know <laughs> please please tell me now is there something I should know that fucking awful record and uh, Street Cafe by Ice House and um it was those kind of, it was that kind of really start of kind of high 80s gloss pop. Love Resurrection by Anderson Moy, which is fucking great. Yeah. Um, and then it became absolute chaos. Um, there were constant sackings, changes of regime. It ended up with Roland Rass and Timmy Mallet. So <laughs> I wasn't really going to hang around there either. Um, um <laughs> Roland Rat, yeah. Uh, one of my colleagues on Shindig, he's a bit younger than me. The Rat Rap was the first record he bought, and he has the 12 inch version of it to this day. <laughs> 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 right, so, 
the book business was obviously very different to that um, and also very different to now. No ebooks, no online retailers, no self-publishing. So what do you see as the benefits and drawbacks of these changes which we have now? So you went wrote a book at 1984. Tell me a bit about that, how, how you got to do that and, and what drove you to do that first. Well, that was, I was offered it. It was a King's Special Biography. So I, I have meant it I had here, to go and... on the shelf. Yeah. The... Okay, well, it yeah. Meant, I meant, meant I had to go and talk to the fucking Davies brothers. Yeah. Um, and Dave actually was totally great. Yeah. Uh, I adore Dave. And he was a huge inspiration to me when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, because he introduced the whole idea of, to me, of gender not being totally fixed. So I remember seeing Dave on telly doing, you really got me. Um, mm -hmm. So it must have been August 64. And he had l long hair down to there. And I thought, wow, they got a girl in the group. That's really great. Mm -hmm. And I found out six months later, he wasn't a girl. He was a boy. And that greatly impressed me, I have to say. Yeah. And one of the reasons I adored pop music is because the, the, you know, young men could look like Dave Davis. They didn't have to look like bloody footballers. Yeah. Um, who had short hair and long shorts and got shouted at on rainy afternoons. I mean, what's the point of that? Mm. Um, and I was definitely a music ver music and art versus sport person, or, although I do quite enjoy sport now because I've got older and mellower. Um, so, um, and Ray was as tricky and as brilliant as you would imagine. Yeah. And uh, we had a very intense and then fractious relationship and funnily enough I, I didn't take it personally um, even though it got quite shouty at times um, but um, so it was all set up with the publisher I just had to walk in and do it and I enjoyed doing it um, and I loved the kinks I still I still love the kinks even, even though I did even though I, I did the book um, and and dealt with them all um but there weren't that many pop books this was the thing about also in, even in 1991 mm -hmm. in 1991 when i published england streaming there were only two books out about punk one of them was glenn matlock the other one was by a man called dave lang who's a friend of mine who's, who was who was just died called one called wonders which is actually a very a very kind of quite a serious little book it's very very good um and there's been this huge explosion of interest in um, pop culture and youth culture and counterculture <coughs> during, during the last 30 years. Um, oh, that's my, what dog's dog. that? that's my what? cockapoo, my, my feisty cockapoo who hears noises outside the window. I'll just remove her. I'll be, it's because a dog's walking by. All right, you're going to go in the other room? Yeah, you go, go out there. Well, no barking. You say, no barking. Sorry, John, that's, she might do that again. Oh, so, cute. Uh, <laughs> Cute. So, um, so, 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 I mean, in a way, you're asking the same thing as the internet and social media in general, which is obviously on one level, people have more access now. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is, how do you get heard? How do you get read? Mm -hmm. So, although the, there's an infinitely, uh, infinite infinitely more access available to people which is great but then it's harder to get heard in a lot of cases yeah it's the same with music as well isn't it exactly exactly yeah. yes i mean i remember you know this is when i was I, I bought that as a kid i bought the who book by richard barnes and you're right oh, yeah that's great that's great there were very very few things and now you know you are the king you do it but there are so many sort of two-bit ebooks you can buy on amazon um, by obviously they sell 10 copies and everybody can do it but it's it's the same as um when a computer came out with design you know everybody can can mock something up but nobody can design a magazine properly unless you've been trained it's it's the same thing access to everything so easy now isn't it yes well there's that old rancid joke there are a million stories in the naked city but not all of them are interesting <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, let's talk I'm about sorry to say, I mean, I do genuinely, you know, one of the things I am enjoying now, mm. I think there's a lot of really good writing about pop music, um, probably better than ever before, and better mm. than ever before, because 
it comes from a much wider range of people. There's a lot more women, there's a lot more people of color, there's a lot more gay people, yes. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's much more diverse and they're looking at things in a different way. So mm. actually there was, I've just read a couple of articles recently about historical figures who abused their, there was a very good piece by, um, I can't remember his name. I think it was on Huffington Post about Kim Fowley raping one of the runaways. And it was really shredding, it was really upsetting. Yeah. And there was another one on, on the quietus by Luke, I think it was by Luke Turner about just exactly what a shit Genesis Peorage was. Yeah. You know. Um, and I mean I knew Jen well, um, but then I decided I didn't want to be involved. Probably because I intuited that something like that was going on. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken quite a lot with Cozy Fanny Tutti about this and and obviously read her book. And it's really good that these kind of injustices are being are being tackled. Uh, and I know that's kind of very serious, but yes. there you go. No, the walls have been, and we make a sense of, they need a lot of editing, you know, 20 year old girls. They have something different to say about the sort of beery balls driven rock and roll sound. You know, they have a different perspective on it and they're young and they're looking at it like you were saying about studying classics. They're looking at this thing as a historical thing. Yes. Where you were living it. You lived punk. You were there. But it's it's become history now. It's become social history. And I think, you know, your writing is, is a bedrock of, of social history. But this next question is exactly well, that's very that. nice. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's, um, you know, some of your writing focuses on specific years and artists. Others are broader overviews of styles and trends. Have you ever started a book intending it to be about one thing? And as it developed, watch it morph into something else? No, uh, not really. I'm a planner. Um, you know, I'm a bloody Virgo. I plan everything. Um, uh, but it does, books do take you places that you didn't think you were going to go. I mean, I actually, it did happen with teenage. Yeah, it did happen with teenage. 66, I knew what I was going to do. I had the plan. Yeah. My new book that I'm doing, I've got the plan. Mm -hmm. England's Dreaming, I had the plan. I knew I was going to have to end in 79, although I did originally do a long postscript for England's Dreaming that, was, that featured crass because I, I just thought they were extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, but I cut it out because it just didn't work. Um, but Teenage was supposed to be, um, you know, right up to the present day when I, when I got commissioned, which is the mid-90s. Mm -hmm. And I just dug myself into a hole and I remember by, you know, by, by the millennium, by the time of the millennium, maybe a bit later, no later it was, it was about 2003, I'd got down to 1929, I'd written 150,000 words. And so I emailed both my editors, who were both women, um, Wendy Wolf and Jenny Uglo, who were both fantastic editors. And I said, help, I got a problem. And I, ha but I got an idea. And the idea is that I finished in 1945 um, because you've got the atom bomb, you've got the invention of the teenager, you've got the creation of the first world world in which we've all been brought up and all to some extent considerably benefited from it with our privilege in this country. Um, so, uh, so it did become something different and I never did go on beyond 1945. Um, Interesting. Would you do a part two? Would you think it's been done to death, you know, Robert Elms and all of these books about post-war working class cult? I mean, it, it's, I'd love to see you do it, but it, the sort of 1945 to what, the rave generation, an awful lot happened, didn't it? Well, that's the problem. Uh, I mean, teenage, teenage nearly broke me, it took seven years. And I look at it now and I just think, how the fuck did I do that? Mm. Uh, really, I mean, I couldn't imagine doing anything like that. And all the books I've done since have been much more tightly defined in concept, mm -hmm. hence the planning, mm -hmm. and so much easier to do. They're not endless. Um, um, and obviously what happens, certainly from 54, 55 onwards, um, or maybe with Elvis, um, with James Dean and Elvis, funny enough, I've just been writing about this, but from 55, 56 onwards, it, the, the amount of data just increases exponentially. You've just led me on to the next question from our professor proofreader, uh, Professor Fiona Macquarie from Canada's asked this one, and uh, she says, you must read a lot of background information while writing your books and assembling your compilation albums. Yeah. Do you read for fun? And if so, what types of book do you favour? I'll show you my floor. 
can you see in the background? I can see. I can, there's books. It's it's not that tidy. Lots of books. Lots of books. But there, you know, I, I know where everything is. Um, what you're getting here is is the is the Brian Epstein, the Brian Epstein picture by Robert Whitaker, which wow. he, he actually owned. Wow. Uh, a Hollywood Bowl poster from 60, 65 and one to Apple one to four bag. So that's my Beatles corner. Brilliant. And then behind there, you can't see them is um, a couple of two or three Derek Jarman pictures. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I get sent a lot of books, so I read them. Um, I tend to like history books because that's what I do. Yeah. If I'm going on to, the, I, I, because I read so much, um, I don't have an enormous amount of time to read for pleasure. And I do read music books, pop culture books, youth culture books, you know, um, gay culture, all the stuff that I'm interested in as a I matter of course. And, um, but if I'm going on the beach, I'll read crime books, yeah. crime novels. Yeah. And I'm very into the minute into, in fact, I went on the beach yesterday and uh, picked up, you know, I've got about 10, 20 books by Ross MacDonald. Do you know of him? No, I don't. He's, he's fantastic. I think he's better than Raymond Chandler. Okay. He's very terse. He's very, very terse. He's not macho. He's very terse. And it's kind of loser California. And it's from 1950 to kind of 1970. Oh, I'm going to investigate. Ross MacDonald. He's absolutely terrific. He's just the most fantastic writer. Fantastic. Uh, well, um, I love crime novels anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I imagine, you know, it's like us, you know, all of us, all the people we were speaking about when we came in, what is pleasure and what is work, you know? So obviously, as you said, you read lots of social history and lots of music and youth culture books, but it, it's your work, but it's also things you would read if you weren't fortunate enough to work in this. If you were a bank manager, you'd still be reading these books, wouldn't you? Yes, I would, yeah, I would. Yeah. And this is another question sort of going back, and I, I guess so many things are, but I, I think it has a point. I sort of... Um, rearrange this from one of our writers and so it's a little bit wacky but I, I, um, in say 20 years from now what do you think the critical consensus would be on genres of the past how will Britpop be viewed will there be a time when we see reappraisal of other areas of music that may have been embarrassing is it possible that Oasis will eventually be viewed as the Bay City Rollers and the Pet Shop Boys become as loved and valued as the Beach Boys Hmm. Well, in 20 years time, I probably won't be around. So I'm not that asked. Um, um, I think that um, what we, when we were talking before about 20, young 20 year old women looking at kind of historical rock, I think it's always interesting to see younger people, what they take out of the past. And actually, that's one of the things that keep me, keeps me going. I actually like seeing um you know i don't think well that's not right that's not how i experienced it yeah. is oh well yeah that's interesting you know and i do find it very interesting to read different perspectives yes. on stuff that i've lived through because i've always been pretty partisan and i might have been wrong yes. and i mean for instance i slagged off Britpop mercilessly at the time and uh i watched a bb they did one of those bbc four comps an hour of Britpop classics mm -hmm. <laughs> it was fucking great yeah. and i really enjoyed it because it was short sharp pop music yeah and it was kind of funny and it it was it was um concise and it was quite punky yeah and i thought oh actually it wasn't too i still think blur is shit though by the way everybody um i never liked them um so you know you can change your mind about things yes. um i think it's important to do that um personally and then well i don't think oasis oasis were huge but then they became very uninteresting so um i think i don't i mean and i think the pet shop boys already are as loved as, as yes they, they are I, actually they? Yeah. I think actually the Pet Shop Boys, you know, is to, is just the most fantastic catalogue. Yeah. And that's one of the things my partner and I bond on. So when we're driving around the car, we play just a USB stick of Pet Shop Boys. And there's so many, you know, fantastic songs, particularly, you know, particularly the non-obvious ones either. Yeah, I dropped them in because I think their time will come because, of course, that, you know, late 80s, the 90s are the period that the 
18, 19, 20 year olds are discovering now. It's old to them. It's, it's older to them than the 60s was to me. And so I think, you know, that these, these acts are going to be the ones that people do take notice to. Also what they stood for, you know, it, it, it was a different time. And I think looking back at that period with the modern days uh, youth, you know, they're, they're so politically engaged and yes. very open-minded that I think acts like the Pet Shop Boys will, will mean an awful lot to them. Well, you know, the Pet Shop Boys did Oasis once. Um, they had a song called The Truck Driver and His Mate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Such a good song. I got the double penis 12-inch cover, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I mean, I, 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 I really liked Oasis first year. I thought they were terrific. That first, um, those first two albums were very, you know, it was it was bringing that punk attitude, wasn't and it? And they had a generosity. Mm -hmm. They were actually very, you know, I don't get mine and if you don't get yours, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, that was very important at that moment, which kind of goes on to your next question in a way, because yeah. Oasis seemed to have some kind of function in the last days of, the, of, of, of that particular Tory regime. I remember going to, and this is, you know, my answer to the key ingredients lift certain studies about pop culture, about the ordinary mundane, you know, time and place, what was going on. So mm -hmm. for instance, 1996, Brit, Brit Awards, Blur, in, um, Oasis endorsed Tony Blair. It was, very, and it was, that was such an important moment. Pet yeah. Shop Boys also played with David Bowie. Yeah. Iggy Pop gave an award, danced around the stage and got all the young girls going crazy. Jarvis Michael moved Jackson. his way through yeah. Michael Jackson. It was the most fantastic event. But the most important thing about it was, was, was Oasis endorsement of new labor. So they were part of that movement, um, yeah. which gave us three labor governments. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I know people criticised New Labour and there were things that New Labour did and they didn't, but they won three elections and they're not the fucking Tories. Yeah, quite. And I was of an age where that meant everything. And it was a vibrant era. That, that was a pot. It was a time of positivity for sure. And, and pop music was linked to that. Yes, absolutely. We'll get to that in a minute on um, bringing up the, the gay thing, but we're not there yet. And we're... we're I don't think you are disappointed with today's teenager. This no, question, God, no, not at all. Are you disappointed with them or have we a lot to learn from them? I think we have a lot to learn from them because they're going to they're going to be dictate, dictating the future. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're a teenager, if you're if you're 19, 20, you, you know what this is like. If you're 19, 20 and you've got any spirit, you're entering, you know, a world that adults made. And you can see what's wrong with it. Um, and if, if you've got any spirit, you want to do something about it. Um, and that's an incredibly powerful moment. Yeah. Um, and so obviously having written a book about teenagers, it's a topic in general I get asked about and I'm engaged with. Um, and thankfully not having children myself, I can be more dispassionate about it. Um, and I also, I'm still in touch with how I felt as a teenager. It doesn't mean that I think I'm a teenager because I don't, because I'm not. <laughs> but I still remember how I felt, what I got from the music and those kind of ideals that I had. And I'm still very much in touch with them. Um, so, you know, I can even listen to rubbish records that I liked when I was 15. Well, not rubbish, but, you know, yeah, I, they don't really. You know, Spooky 2 does not translate very well, but I fucking loved it because I, I loved it then. Yeah, and yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Nine Minutes of Evil Woman. No. Sorry, boys. <laughs> no, I, I think you're right, and they are great. And I think, you know, now it's not so much about pop music and fashion to a degree. You know, I've got a, a nearly 18-year-old daughter, and the sort of fashion they look back to is the 90s. That's retro to them. But I don't think we're reinvent. I don't think we're inventing a future, but the way they're engaged with ecology, yes. gender, um, race is so different than my era. My era was, you know, the 80s and 90s, and it was no different than the Victorian time, the, the, the way people spoke. And I think now they are such an engaged generation of young people that maybe that culture's moved beyond pop culture, pop music culture. It's become something else. Well, I, I think so. I think the thing is that music used to be the driving force of pop culture and youth culture. That is no longer the case. 
for all sorts of reasons, possibly because of pop music's success. Mm. It's just become part of the fabric of every li day life. It's omnipresent. Yes. Um, it is abs and which is very different from maybe your experience, certainly my experience, where you had to fight quite hard to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, all the classic things that everybody says about the 60s are true. Yeah. You had to really fight to hear the fucking Yardbirds. Yeah. Um, you know, it wasn't something that was a given. Uh, you had to fight to hear Bob Dylan um, or, and even the Beatles. Um, so unless you had the records mm. um, and then that was a whole other, whole, whole other thing because um, mm. records are very expensive and um, except singles. Um, so what I think about teenagers now is that obviously the biggest thing is climate change and the real teenage superstar is Greta Thunberg and um, that is there. Each generation has their own task, it has their own time. Our gener my generation's task, I was born in 53, was to kind of deal with the effects of the war um, and start unlocking Victorian England really. Um, uh, not to wish that they'd fought in the war with in the war, which you know moronic idiots of my generation still wish they'd done. I mean, the amount of people who hark back to the Second World War in idealised terms is really pathetic. Which is the whole kind of Brexit phenomenon. It's totally, uh, is. yeah. It, it's just, it's just, um, imbecil it's just imbecilic. Yeah. Um, anyway, so their task is to do with climate change and of course um what's happened in the last few years and in fact this disguised polemic at the end of teenage i realized after i've written it which is that the post-war reconstruction which is america and england um being the good guys and the whole idea of democratic consumer culture is now over we're no longer the good guys well maybe america's becoming the good guys again but maybe they won't because yeah. you know the, because of what the um, Republicans are doing. Yep. But certainly yep. we're not, no. um, you know, Britain's become super stinky is it, because, of, because of the Tories and Brexit. Um, and, and, you know, Germany for a while became the good guy. Yep. And the whole idea of consum consumerism itself is becoming seen to be part of the problem. Yes. The 60s was consumerism and now it, Amazon is the, you know, the bad guy and, and so, yeah, exactly. And, and teenage of, of the 60s was, was founded on consumerism and disposable things. And, and now that brought, but that brought enfranchisement. Yeah. That happened at the same time, as you know, that happened at the same time as civil rights in America. I mean, can you imagine dancing in the street without the civil rights movement? Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. can you imagine, um, you know, David Bowie without the Gay Liberation Front? Yeah. You know, can you can you imagine, you know, Janice Ian, Janis Joplin, um, Laura Nairo without the second wave of feminism? You know, all of these things came together. So so and it was genuinely I mean, one of the intellectual fascinations for me with pop culture was that it was a genuinely a democratic mass art form. Mm -hmm. That's was, that was, it wasn't an elite art form, it was a mass art form. And that was really exciting, but that's all changed. It's, yeah, totally. And that's brilliant. It, it's brilliant that it's changed. And talking about change, um, has the age of, this, this is coming in from that again, I guess, talking about music, um, has the age of digital streaming spelled disaster for musicians and pop music generally? Well, you know, musicians should get paid for their work. Mm. So if they're not getting paid enough on Spotify, which is seems to be the case, yeah. um, then it's a bad thing. Yeah. Um, and I always disagreed with the music should be for free argument. Mm -hmm. And I always used to engage people who said that and say, mm. well, how would you feel if you weren't paid for your work? Yeah. Um, you know, so Musician, every all content providers should get paid, but of course the model has now been is that the parasites, the interfaces, get the money, and the people that actually make the stuff don't Trends. get the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, which um, is all, which is which is completely wrong. Yeah, totally. And and, and um, on a more positive, do you still get the same thrill from writing? You're writing a book at the moment, as you did at the beginning of your career. I do enjoy doing it. 
and I find it quite easy. Um, I mean, I have to wind myself up a lot. Um, but when I'm started, I, I write very quickly. Um, and um, yeah, because sometimes it's, it's great when it's done and then you look back and you think, oh, those bits are quite good. Uh, and I'm always a great editor of my own material. And also I don't mind being edited either. It's a great privilege to be edited, to be honest. Have somebody intelligent look at your work yeah. and try to make it better. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I still enjoy it. Um, I think that uh, I wouldn't do it if I didn't really. Yeah, no, makes sense. And totally changing the conversation. Well, I mean, obviously it's work. Obviously in life, it's not, obviously it's work yes. sometimes. And sometimes I have to write things I don't particularly want to because I get asked and I just think I better make some money. Yes. Um, but you know, we all have work stuff to do, but yeah. in general, I do enjoy it. And it could be a lot worse. The work could be far, far worse. Well, quite. <laughs> and uh, going back to Bowie, you did a killer playlist for oh, Mojo yeah. that would have been a fascinating artist compilation. Assuming money and licensing were no object, who would be oh. your bucket list if you were to let loose on something to curate it? So it doesn't have to be Bowie, it could be anything. So if you could do a killer compilation, pulling out tracks that aren't on the others, who would you focus on? I don't know, really. Um... I mean, we can't even get Bowie for the Ace Comps, by the way. No. Uh, because I wanted, you know, I wanted Bowie throughout, and it's just impossible. Lots. Um, I mean, there are certain catalogues you just can't get. You can't get the Stones. You can't get the Beatles. Um, you can't get Eric Clapton. Yeah. Mind you, you know. <laughs> I wasn't going to include I shot the show David on, <laughs> on your 66 comp I mean David is one of you could have had him on your 66 comp you could have had him on your 70s comp so I mean obviously you're not staying away from him for instance I because... think we did I think we got did, did we not get the London boys on the 66 comp you, I think you that. may have done actually okay but that was of course the DRAM stuff yeah as opposed to the RCA stuff and I, I can't remember where the catalogue is maybe we snuck under the radar yeah. I can't I just I'm so sort of focused on doing the ones that I'm doing and I really enjoy doing the ace ones yeah. and even though you can't always get what you want the compromise is kind of part of part of the delight in yeah. a funny kind of way. You go in, I mean, I'm just starting, an, I mean, we, I've got another one in, in production, which is 77 to 79. Interesting. Um, That'll be the last question then, which, which we're answering now, because what does the future hold for you and, you're, and what, what are you doing currently? So this compilation, I will move this to the end. And so you're going into that period which we initially came in with, that 77 post well, years. Um, I've noticed that, I mean, it's carrying on with the idea of singles. It's all singles. Yep. Um, and one of the things that I've tried to do, except for the, particularly with the kind of 69, 70, one was very rock. Um, and the 69, 72 to 76 was also pretty rock, really. Yep. But yep. what happened, and this was, again, a reflection of what I was actually listening to. And then 77 to 79 is going to be different because I was listening to dub reggae and I was listening to electronic disco music and Euro disco. So mm -hmm. it's going to have punk, Euro disco, post-punk, dub reggae. So it's going to be much more mixed up again, which I'm happy Interesting. about. Interesting. Interesting. Because all compilations tend to be so niched now. Yes. You know, yes. it's just punk. And I'm bored with hearing a whole... I don't want to hear 26 yes. to 48 uh, punk tracks. I'm talking of comps... Um... We're, we're not, I, I remember your Meridian 71 comp, you know, that was before oh, yeah, this, this 50. If that's a great comp, and that must be 20 odd years old, is it 15, 20 years old? 50, uh, I think it was 2005. That was on Heavenly. That was Jeff Barrett, yeah. Yeah, right. And that was, that was again, that was the stuff it, that came out of my 60th birthday party and having a few friends around of a certain age mm -hmm. and actually recalling the music we actually used to like as opposed to the record the music we pretended to like during the punk period because you had to kind of you know forget you like little feet for a while and um, like and, and gene clark and and all the rest of it um and I so that, that was song. yeah well it's 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 a mood um and again at that time well you'll know this because this is one of your specialities mm. um 69 70 71 
Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody in the Buffalo Springfield had a solo album. Yeah. Okay. Most of them were really not very good. Yeah. So there were almost every member of a big 60s band had solo albums. Mm -hmm. And most of them were shit, but there were one or two tracks on each album that, that were absolutely fantastic. That that could be the area you would hone into if you could, uh, you know, that have your the catalog to get to because it, it it's like those the birds reunion album the gene clark songs are by far the best and just pulling all of those out and making making an interesting com you know. that, that album is quite shocking for, i mean i want to like it but honestly i actually just bought got had a it's new not album. bad it's not I bad i quite like it i like that coked out la sound it's not horrible but it's not the birds is it well changing heart is just fantastic and I loved, um, I also love Roadmaster. I had that in the summer of 76 when I was having a bad time and uh, used to play Misty Morning on a Misty Morning oh, yeah. obsessively. Gene and is I think, bad. oh dear. <laughs> well, let, let's go to a different, uh, we've only got three questions and then we're, the, then we're free to go. School is over. But um, let's come in with the queer noise. It's not school, it's not school, John, it's fine. And it's so, well, I, I haven't finished really. I, I, I'll answer the rest of the last question once we're done. Oh yeah, no, go back to that now, finish. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm writing a new book. Um, and I'll, you know, I'm not going to discuss what it's about because I'm superstitious, but yeah. I've got to finish it within a year. So I'm in the middle of it. And then I've got a big project with Manchester University, which again, I can't discuss because we're not, it's still under wraps, but they've made me a professor of pop culture. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So I have uh, very strong links now with a major kind of academic organization in the city that I'm incredibly fond of and have very strong links to. And in fact, in fact, the factory exhibition, which I did with Matt Bancroft at uh, Chelsea Space about um, 18 months ago, has just moved to Museum of Science and Industry. Um, and it's opening in a couple of weeks and it's been curated by uh, Jan Hicks and Matt and I have been uh, what's the word, consultants. And so it's going to be quite big. It's going to be much bigger than Chelsea space. So I'm starting to do exhibitions as well, which I really enjoy. Um, and again, because that's working with people. Um, you know, to me, the real work is sitting in the room writing. When mm. I'm working with people doing stuff, it's great fun. It's almost like play. And there's another exhibition I've been involved with starting in December at Manchester Art Gallery, which is about Derek John. Excellent, excellent. So you're going to be busy. So we're coming out of this absolute nightmare and, and you've got a lot ahead of you. So it's it's all exciting moving forward for you. It, well, yes. I mean, I've just got a lot to do. Sometimes I feel too much. But um, but, um, you know, I, I like working. I'm very fortunate, and as we've discussed, to do the work that I, I, I love. So, you know, why? why not do it? And I don't drink or take drugs anymore. So I'm completely sober because I got too much to bloody do and I'm too old anyway. Fair play. Well, let's go back to when <laughs> you were a bit younger. I have a hanker. I have a hankering and then I just think, oh God, I can't be bloody bothered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Queer Noises comp, 1961 yeah. to 1980. We're kind of going over old ground here, which we addressed earlier, but I think it, 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 it would be closure on what, what we were saying earlier. Um, so you've written exclusively about gay culture in the press and obviously this compilation. And as a gay man that has witnessed music move from psychedelia into glam, punk, disco, synth pop, how do you think camp and homosexuality in pop have changed and shaped society? Um, enormously. And that's what I'm writing the book about. Excellent. <laughs> so that, that, that we, this is just perfectly made for that i mean obviously yeah. that there is a book in it i mean obviously i could let you talk for probably five hours on this and i just haven't got the fingers to tell well i think i think totally i just think totally um yeah. i think it's had a huge influence and you know and um I mean, it, you know, I mean, as we, as I've already said, you know, it started for me by seeing Dave Davis and thinking, and I loved the fashions of the 60s. Yeah. I loved the fact that men started having long hair yeah. and started not looking like footballers. Yeah. Um, and, um, and obviously then David Bowie was huge for me. Um, growing up gay in the 70s was pretty shit, you know. 
um, mm -hmm. it really wasn't nice. And so during the punk time, um, it was a very negative period. Um, it feels incredible now. And the advances that have been made um, during the last 50 years have been incredible. But, mm. you know, you had Larry Grayson and Larry Inman, and I know they're being rediscovered now, which is great because they deserved to be, but at the time it was pretty depressing. Yeah. And you had Jeremy Thorpe, and it's, the whole idea of, you know, being gay was not seen as something that it was... It was pretty bad. You were outcast, you know. Um, I never, I mean, in, during the punk period, it meant that I saw things in a different way, um, hence the interest in gender. But, you know, I was very unhappy. I never thought I could ever be happy. Hmm. How about the early 80s? Was that like a sort of... Well, don't forget, then you got AIDS coming like a fucking express train. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I went to New York and went down Christopher Street in 78, and I was terrified. I never liked the clone culture um, at all. So I was never at ease really um, with, gay, with, I never was never, I wasn't a great drinker. No. Um, I, and so I was never, and you know, I, I never was greatly at ease in gay bars no. or even in gay clubs. Um, so it was, and then AIDS, you know, I thought I was going to die for six months. Um, Petrifying. Yeah. It was absolutely horrible. In fact, that going back to the Pet Shop Boys, I was so pleased that they used It's a Sin for Russell T. Davis's what, what drama. A great it was show. It was fantastic. Well, and they brought the whole lot back. To be in the curriculum, that show. And, and it was yes. done with a degree of humour as well. It, you know, it was very shockingly sad, but it, it was just a very enjoyable TV drama. It, it, I, I don't think it was preachy in any way. It was fantastic. There were some bits were corny, but mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, you know, you know, going into gay bars and everybody being fabulous and friendly, uh-uh, it wasn't like that. <laughs> you go right. into a gay bar and everybody would be going, yeah. looking down their noses at you, withering yeah. looks. Um, but the corniness worked within the context of what the film, I, I, I thought it was fantastic. I really, really liked it. Yeah. And of course, It's a Sin is probably the Pet Shop Boys' angriest song. It's a very angry song. Yeah. Um, and so... You know, I mean, I'm I'm friendly with Neil Tennant, and we used to discuss all this a lot. So that's when mm -hmm. we started hanging out in '84. So we obviously discussed all this stuff a lot. Um, and I know it's such a huge area. I, I think I, I, I mean I could go on for ages. I so. know, and and I think that 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 book is going to be fantastic. But I I've got I've got a nice short paragraph here, and I think you're you know you sum it up with enormously, you know, how much of um, camp and homosexuality. Yeah, that's enough, that's enough. Um, and now, um, of all the musicians and seamsters you've interviewed over the years, Strummer, Townsend, Beefheart, the Davis Brothers, Nick Cave, Kurt Cobain, which one stand out as the most memorable? Really the most memorable was Kurt Cobain. Um, that was July, 1993. It was part of a press trip, the only press trip I ever did. Um, where we, a whole load, a bus load of journalists got flown over to New York to interview Kurt about in utero. He wanted to talk to me because he'd read England String. Mm -hmm. And so um, Anton Brooks, press officer, told me that. And so I had the interview before I had an outlet. And um, eventually Dylan Jones at the Observer magazine took it. Um, um, but, and I remember that. Um, they were like the Sex Pistols in Britain in 1977. They were the biggest rock group in the whole country and nobody quite knew what they were going to do. And that was down to Kurt. I'm mm -hmm. sorry about the other two. The other two were what the other two are. Mm -hmm. It was Kurt and everybody was interested in Kurt. And, um, every, and he was the one that was unpredictable. So I spent an evening with Kurt and Courtney who I really liked by the way. Mm -hmm. um, she's had a really bad press and I think she's terrific. I think she's very, very brave and interesting person. Um, and um, it was one of those um, interviews that started about midnight and went on to the three in the morning and time seemed to stop. And we got on very well and he was very interesting and I had this fantastic interview. Brilliant. And so I rocked up the next morning um, to go to the, you know, the photo session. And Anton Brooks rushed out of the lift and said, Kurt's OD'd. Uh, you know, the stupid fucker had overdosed on heroin mm. and nearly killed himself. 
Um, and those are the famous Jesse Froman pictures of him with the big white glasses. And he's wearing the big white glasses because he's still smacked off his tits, basically. Mm -hmm. And then they played Roseland um, that evening. And it was a very muted kind of show. Um, and I remember there was a younger female journalist with me and she was really shocked by absolutely everything. And I had to sort of, I just said, look, let's just forget all this and go, I'll take you around to see some friends and stuff. And I just took her around the village um, and popped in some shops where I knew people and just calmed her down a bit. So it was a very heightened kind of 36 hours. Wow. Um, I remember and that. obviously Kurt's become this thing. Yes. He's become and a I mean, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I'm so not um, conversant with opiate behaviour, you know, mm -hmm. so I didn't know what, quite what was going on in some respects. He looked a bit scabby, that's all I noticed. No, bless him. And that's a long time ago, you know, he is a poster now, like Jim Morrison. He, he's uh, another one of those 27 club sort of icons, isn't he? Well, it was the last big, it was one of the last big rock interviews I ever did. I was just turning 40. I was 40 later on that year. And I just thought I can't really be doing this. And particularly after he died, mm -hmm. uh, I just thought enough, you know, this, it's too, it was, it was very involving and very emotionally draining. Um, and I was very, very upset when he died. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just turned my back on really um, on that kind of, rock genres when I did very, very few big interviews with rock stars after that. I just had enough. And... Understood, understood. And this would be the last question because we answered yeah. the last one uh, five minutes ago. So this is coming away from that, really something positive. Um, how much new music are you listening to these days? Or do you find comfort and pleasure in revisiting all of those old favourites from your teen years? Are, are you still, you know, using spotify to sort of listen to the latest stuff or you just thought i've heard all the stuff i want to hear and um I i'll listen to my records no i get i get recommended stuff um so let's have a look at what i put into my itunes i don't all my friends are on it use spotify i don't very much mm -hmm. i still buy cds yep. so i've actually just bought for the first time rumors by fleetwood mac Great album, <laughs> great album. Uh, I've just bought the Soul Jazz Comp to, I can't remember what's called, something about guitar and a drum machine. Um, oh, that, is that one of the German ones? Or? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, yeah. I buy almost anything on Compact. Yeah. K-O-M-P-A-K-T. I've got the Coral album. Great um, one. I, I buy a lot of electronic stuff, a lot of electronic stuff. Um, and if I was to choose one genre that I say I like, it would be electronic stuff um, because it just sounds modern. I always wanted pop music to sound modern, um, and that. And then, of course, I do. You know, I do revisit. Um, I've got the new Nissan Sony album, Immigrants. Um, you know, um, so I do, and I listen to a lot. Of, I've got two Technics decks, and you know, play singles and play albums. And, um uh and just everything really what have i been playing that's old recently um hmm. oh i played everybody knows this is nowhere last night loud yeah uh, album. yeah my yeah, still yeah. still my favorite neil young album neil young one the first neil young album. I, I just cleaned Fucking up my old it. vinyl copy got the new record deck that the arrangements are just fantastic and what a psychedelic cover it's the best yeah. It's the best. And I actually, I can't believe that people are so lazy about things, you know, um, because Neil doesn't particularly like it and he got fucked up in the processing, you know, everybody says, oh, it's not very good. It's completely brilliant. Yeah. And that's the one I heard first. That's the one I bought first when I got that in early 69. As a new release. Yeah. As a new release. And so that was my first big exposure to Neil. And I still like, I still, I still like a bit, I still like a bit of Neil. I love Psychedelic Pill. I thought that was great. He's great. He's great. <laughs> well, it's brilliant talking to you as always. I'm going to make sure that I save this nicely now uh, and I'm going to work away on it. I will send you 
the, the the sort of transcript so just the the names to make sure i've got everything yeah right. great and then you can see it so it will take me about a week john but i will email it across to you i won't bother bringing dan in i'll just send him the finished magazine when it's right done. no that's it's a lot of fun it's always it, it's great to be in shindig as well it's a magazine i really like Excellent. Well, uh, always a pleasure. How, how's still, Andy do? How's Andy doing? Andy's fine. I mean, he's down in Somerset in Froome. So oh, over yeah. lockdown, we've been, you know, having a beer on Zoom. But I haven't seen him in a, over a year. So hopefully, he's going to get up to town soon. But things are slowly starting to feel normal again now, which is good, isn't it? As long as it lasts. I know. We've got to be careful. I'm going to have a beer outside with a neighbour, but I, I don't trust going. Enjoy. Absolutely brilliant talking. All right. Fantastic <laughs> answers. I'll okay. speak to you soon, John. Okay, all the best. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, bye, bye.